Welcome to the College Audition Podcast with your host, nationally renowned college audition coach, Tim Evanicki. Hey everybody, Tim Evanicki here and welcome to another episode of the College Audition Podcast. I am here today with Caitlin Hopkins, head of musical theater at Texas State University. Thanks so much for joining me today, Caitlin. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to see you. Oh, it's been a while. You. It's been so long <laughs> since we've actually seen each other, I know. I know. So, um... One of the things that we always want to do in the podcast is not just to get, get to know the program, but we want to get to know you a little bit more, too. So if you could share with us a little bit about your your background, your training, and and what actually led uh, to you becoming the head of musical theater at Texas State University. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Big, wide open um, question, however you want to answer. Where do I begin? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, gosh, well... I, I came to theater in a trunk, literally. Um, no, my my whole family was in show business. My mom was a very successful film, television, and theater actress, and my father was a theater producer, and my stepfather was a screenwriter, television writer, playwright, and so I I, I grew up in, I literally grew up in the industry in sort of all aspects of it: theater, film, and television. And um, from the time I was very very young, wanted to be an actress, you know, be a performer, uh, ultimately evolved into producing and directing and educating. Um, but, you know, for the pr- most of my career, uh, almost 30 years, was working in as an actress in film and television and theater, musicals, plays, radio, voiceovers. <laughs> I, I would basically say yes to anything. Um, and... Um, Gosh, I, I trained at Carnegie Mellon for a year and a half. I ended up uh, leaving that program before I graduated. Uh, I had an amazing opportunity um, as an actress at that time and uh, left to to do that. Um, and, you know, I was very fortunate, got signed by a big agent and just didn't end up going back to school. <laughs> um, and I also trained at RADA at the Royal Shakespeare, uh, you know, in, um, in England and Gosh, I mean, had incredible opportunities along the way with amazing, you know, acting teachers from, you know, Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler to uh, Joan Later in New York as my voice teacher and, you know, just amazing humans along the way. Carol D'Andrea, who's an amazing, amazing educator, uh, actually out in Los Angeles for the years I was out there doing a lot of film and TV. So um, I my training was sort of made up of uh, life experience. Uh, <laughs> I started working professionally when I was 14 um and uh and and sort of out, outside of um a bfa program primarily although i had you know a year and a half within within one that was a wonderful one um and how did i come to this you know sort of um you know i like to say it's kind of a god thing it's kind of a universe thing uh, it found me you know i was um on a national tour at the time i was doing dirty dancing um and, uh, you know, I'd just done a couple films and some Law and Order episodes and what have you and, and was planning when the tour was over to go back to New York. And I had been asked to do, um, they were doing a Broadway revival of Bye Bye Birdie. And I was going to play Mrs. McAfee with Bill Irwin. And um, Texas State contacted me out of nowhere. Oh, they <laughs> said, contacted you. You know, know. you're. Yeah, they, they said, you know, your name keeps coming up. We're, we're looking for somebody to design a new BFA in musical theater program. And we're hoping to find somebody who has had, you know, at least 20 years working professionally and um, has producing experience and fundraising experience and directing experience. And, you know, they, they were sort of um, a, a lot of the things that they were interested in doing were a little outside of the box at the time, um, sort of not going with somebody who perhaps had a doctorate or, you know, even mm-hmm. uh, a master's. There I was without even an undergraduate degree. And I'm like, are you, are you sure? Are you sure you contacted the right person? <laughs> <laughs> um, but they were, it was really exciting. They were really interested in creating a pre-professional training program for young professionals who, you know, um, creating a program that was designed by professionals for young professionals. Like that was, that was a lot of what they were interested in doing and um, found me through a number of sort of bizarre coincidences and uh, asked me if I would come and and talk with them and meet with them. And um, I I didn't obviously have any intention of um, designing a BFA program was not on my bucket list, Tim. Like that was not 
I, I, yeah. Right. I mean, I've done a lot of coaching um, and, and master classes over the years. I, I used to work for the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival and for years, you know, traveled around the country with my husband and taught master classes and I, just as a way to give back, uh, you know, because um, I always had a real passion for working with young artists. And I don't know, I'd been very lucky growing up being mentored by incredible people from Tennessee Williams to, you know, I mean, you name it. Um, I, I had opportunities to work with many of our great American playwrights and directors and actors. And, and that really um, just gave me a taste for passing it on. You know, uh, my parents were real activists and felt um, that giving back to young artists and to your community was part of what being an artist meant being of service. Yeah. And so uh, when that sort of fell in my lap, I thought, oh my gosh, this this opportunity will never come again, right? I can always go back to New York and get a job, right, as an actor. But I thought, you know, what an extraordinary opportunity to uh, use your life experience uh, to to help educate and, and work with young artists. Right. Um, I also really wanted to direct. I really wanted to produce more new work. I wanted... To, to uh, and this environment was going to give me an opportunity to do all those things um, and to literally build it from scratch with you know other professional educators right. and your husband so is there too it. so did did your husband come as a package deal or did he come in after <laughs> <laughs> yeah he, he did you know we've um we've been to we met doing a show called bat boy the original production of bat boy the musical right um and for some reason, from that moment on, uh, for the last 20 years, you know, people kept sort of hiring us to work together, which is kind of interesting. Like we did Bear pop opera together and we did a lot, you know, a lot of new work and it, we were just, it was just sort of a match made in heaven, I guess. Right. So um, we got very used to working together and collaborating together. And uh, he had been a Broadway performer for many years as well. Um, and then transitioned into playwriting. I was a Lark playwright fellow with Katori Hall and Tina Howe and Ken Lynn and uh, Carson Kreitzer. I mean, he's, he's an amazing playwright. And if I do brag a little myself. Um, <laughs> and we had taught together for years for, with the Kennedy Center, like traveling all over the country doing these master classes. We had always taught together. Um, and when he started playwriting, I was his dramaturg. I directed his work, you know. So it, it just sort of never, occur it just doesn't occur to us not to collaborate and work together. So when they <laughs> approached me, I said, um, you know, I, I, I don't really do this by myself. Like, <laughs> it was a package like this other. Right. Yeah, it was like, um, I was like, I, I don't know if you're interested in this. And they were like, well, it's not normal, but we're trying to do something innovative and creative so you know when you come will you teach a master class together so we can see what it is you're talking about because they were like wait you do what together you teach yeah, yeah. i don't understand i was like well if you're gonna let me build a program from scratch like i also would want it to all be contained under the same umbrella so you're not farming out you know dance classes to a dance school music classes to a music school acting classes to a theater school that all the faculty are like their their only job is to you know, serve the musical theater students because it is its own art form and treating it as a, um, as an integrated uh, space that you're creating, right? So that, you know, our faculty, and that's ultimately what they let me do, yay, I have, we have our own dance teachers, our own voice teachers and all that. So what it allows for is a lot of cross-pollination and integration and collaboration. So it's, it is normal with our, our program to have two or three teachers in a classroom at any one time, whether it's, uh, you know, acting performance or a dance class, you know, the voice teachers coming into the dance class and the dance teachers are coming into the acting, you know, everybody's um, sort of working, working to together. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is a direct result of just how my husband and I have collaborated over the years. You have, so to, you have to admit it's, it's kind of weird. <laughs> You have to admit it is not a normal thing for a husband and wife to live it's together, not. work together, and have it be harmonious all the time. So that's you're very, very uh, yeah. lucky. You're Literally, I mean, we've even you know we we did a musical together in Ireland for a while. <laughs> we've traveled. We've been doing this all over the world. It's really 
I, yeah, I don't know what that is. It's been so amazing. So he was here up until the summer. He was on the musical theater faculty, but he also created the MFA in dramatic writing program here, which is one of right. one very, very successful program, both the undergraduate playwriting and, um, and the MFA. And uh, to, to this day, that, that uh, undergraduate um, playwriting program that he created is hugely, hugely successful. Um, but he stepped away this summer to take over running Fontas full time. <gasps> I didn't know that. Because the, co- the company is like, a- and uh, uh yeah so this so, great segue caitlin thank you so much um <laughs> <laughs> why don't you tell us well, a little bit right. about this other um this company that that you run this other uh, thing i did yeah which i endorse wholeheartedly <laughs> this is not a paid endorsement i i wanted to talk about this so please tell us about fontas sure so fontas is a dry mouth lozenge and oh, in fact i think you know it's, it, here it is. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, and uh, Jim and I created this this lozenge together. <laughs> as, as, one as, as, as one does, as one does with their husband, <laughs> because there wasn't anything on the market that was what I needed. I, I, you know, for years I was like, I don't want something that has menthol and sugar in it. Menthol's drying. Mm-hmm. Sugar makes me clear my throat, which creates swelling. And then you get that raw cheek thing from all the sugar. I mean, you know, like there, there was really nothing that's what I needed because I really um, get really bad dry mouth when I get nervous. And my father, my stepfather had Parkinson's for many years, passed away many years ago now, but was on many, many medications and stuff, suffered from terrible dry mouth. And, you know, um, and I used to make uh, sort of a, a drink, a hot drink version of um, this formula that I made up. And I would make it in like little uh, ice cube trays, like little lozenges at home. And it's all natural. And it's, it's you know, it's glycerin, which is hydrating, uh, apple enzymes, which is a natural antibacterial, uh, naturally thins mucus, um, has nat- natural antibacterial properties, as does Manuka honey. Manuka honey is like the wonder drug, right? So it has Manuka honey in it, has aloe vera, it has a little um, orchid extract and ginseng. You know, all of these ingredients together are, you know, lubricating, create a a real saliva response because it's tart green apple. And here's our big news, which is another reason why Jim had to step away to run the company, is that we, we have new products coming out. So we literally next month are launching our new tart lemon. I'm Lozenge, and I'm sending you a bunch of samples so you can try them. Please do. And we've got a new website. We've got new bags, new branding, new market. Like we're, we've got a whole. We have social media finally. <laughs> so, uh, so Fontas Dry Mouth Lozenges. You know, go check us out. And we're on everything. That's amazing. Um, and, and yeah, I so the company them. has just sort of exploded. So we're. Uh, I'm in the process of. You know, we have a lot of clients over the years, uh, Tim like yourself who've had surgeries or you know are on medications or whatever and one of the things that we noticed was that a lot of cancer um, institutes and people who are going through chemo and radiation have ordered Fontas and told us uh, how helpful it's been I can um, attest with to allergies that. how helpful it's been uh, so and also it doesn't counteract with any medications because it's all natural and right and so we are uh, I, I, I get nervous about kids and seniors um, dealing with lozenges Mm -hmm. or people who are recovering from surgery because they're laying down and it makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, um, you know, about my corgis, right? Lily Dale and Barkley, they're under my feet. So we're, we designed corgi pops. So Lily Dale is the lemon Fontas pop and Barkley is the apple pop. And they're like little faces (laughs) that are on the laddie pops. And that's like our charitable division, but we're, we're going to be, I mean, people can, Normal humans, muggles can can buy them muggles. as a novelty item if they want, but mainly we're going to be donating them to the the children's cancer institutes across the country so that they have something safe that That's can help them. With that so trial. wonderful, and I can tell you, uh, we were talking a little bit before we started recording today. When I was in the hospital after my surgery from esophageal cancer, you know there was uh, weeks where I was unable to have anything by mouth, including water, but they let me have the Fontas lozenges. And I had a bowl of them by my hospital bed, and the nurses would come in and grab a handful of them, put them in their pocket, and take them with them. And they all fell in love with them. 
Um, so I, th- I think I sent you a I'm text so message. Pleased. It's all such a blur. So I, I think I sent you a text message that said, I just want to let you know, you this was such a godsend for me um, because so talk about dry mouth, not being able to have anything, um, including ice chips and things they weren't letting me have, but they let me have the Fontas. Um, yeah. So it was just, it was wonderful. Well, one of the, one of the things you sort of helped in, inspire actually, cause I, you know, was, was really worried about you. Um, you know, we're we're doing research now so that we can um, translate the formula to um, strips. You know, like those Listerine strips. Oh yeah, that's and wonderful. that's the next thing. You know, we we need to um, <laughs> you know make some money first to to to, to pay for the research and to have it right. Uh, you know, sort of transition from a lozenge to a strip because it, it's going to have to sort of be made differently um but i i'm really i'm hopeful about that i think it's really exciting you know the way way i came up with it was because god 30 years ago a long time ago when i was young (laughs) and thin um i was traveling with an opera company i did an opera international tour of an opera years and years ago and i we were performing in the opera house in paris and i was really nervous <laughs> and it was and you know new climate you're traveling on airplanes all the time you're just dry you're just so dehydrated and this older opera singer who happened to be in the dressing room while we were, and we got to talking and he said oh here take some of this um tart green apple he had peeled it right because he said the the peel would you know be too course right but he had cut up little tiny pieces of tart uh, granny smith apples like tart green apples and he said chew on this right before you go on stage it'll create a saliva response you know it's uh, apples very healing for your vocal cords and it will give you something to work with you know when you go out on stage and i was like right. for years i had little baggies and Tupperware containers of tart green apple on like both sides of the stage you know whenever i was working even while i was doing film and tv um, so yeah, so that's sort of where it started. And then, you know, I sort of discovered Manuka honey and I knew glycerin was good. You know, I started researching like what I, what I needed. Wow. And that's well, how it happened. That answers that's a couple questions of for me. I, I was wondering if just one day you were sitting in your kitchen with your apple enzymes <laughs> going, how can I use this? <laughs> that's right. to- <laughs> how can I use it? And the lemon oil, like the tart lemon ones. Are my, I have to say, I can't wait for the lemon ones. They're so good because you really taste the manuka honey too. But it's really, but it's tart. But it's all. So I'm very excited. I'm really excited. I can't wait to see. We've got two more flavors in the works, and then we're gonna have like a mixed bag. It's perfect. All right. Um, we, should, we should get back to okay. your program. I'm sorry. I know. Podcast. People are like, we don't care about your lozenges. We want to know about your program. How about this? Real quick before we, we switch, though, let everyone know where they can get them. I'll let you do that. Um, Oh, where, where can they buy Fontis lozenges now? Yes. So uh, on our website. Okay. So just Google Fontis lozenges or Fontis sciences, um, Fontis dry mouth lozenges, anything like that. Great. And it, the, the old website, which is kind of um, a dinosaur. It's kind of Are they on big, Amazon? Big-y. But it'll, you know, they're... they're there, I, I'm hoping that they've sold out because that's not us selling them. That oh. was Amazon buying them and marking them up. We have a 15% off sale right now on all the Apple ones because we're trying to make way for the Got it. lemon ones coming in. So it's actually less expensive for people to buy it on the website. And ho- hopefully, because we uh, the new website is going to be directly through Shopify, which is going to be great. Awesome. So, but yeah, just Google them. Go get them off the website. It's less expensive. Well, I'm glad and I know we'll that now. I think I've always got them through Amazon. So good to know that now. Um, all right. Back to Texas State. Um, I usually ask the, the heads of the departments to give me their elevator speech on their program. What is it about Texas State? Oh. Um, yeah, I'm putting you on the spot. Well, if you had read That's the, okay. I sent the questions. Well, I know. Time. If I looked at the questions <laughs> you sent me, I would... <laughs> So tell me about Texas State program. If you had to summarize, you know, what, what is the thing that is, I mean, it, it's a very popular program. What is it that attracts all the students to you, do you think? Free samples? <laughs> Fontes? No, no, I'm kidding. Um, what do I think attracts them? Gosh, you know, that's it's a question for them, isn't it? But um, 
I, I think a couple things. I think uh, the holistic approach to training is 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 probably the biggest reason. Um, you know, I, I feel very strongly that if we that no matter how talented uh, you are and how well trained you are, because there's a lot of really people talented people who are good at this, right? Um, that if we are not uh, also educating and training you to take care of yourself, <laughs> your well-being, uh, your work-life balance, your mental wellness, your vocal health, your physical health, your nutrition, your, I mean, everything, right? Um, and we're also not addressing how you run your business, as the brand, as the product, right? So business of the business labs, where you're learning how to read a contract, how to negotiate a contract, how to do your taxes, how to uh, financial plan, mm -hmm. uh, how to, you know, to both, to, to take the talent and the training, right? And give it a delivery system for success, mm -hmm. for longevity, for sustainability, for, you know, our, our job is to teach you how to do this in a healthy, sustainable, repeatable way. Because mm -hmm. anyone who's done eight shows a week for five minutes knows how hard that is and how physically, uh, emotionally, mentally, vocally uh, draining and exhausting it is. We are athletes. Absolutely. We are athletes, right? Um, and we must learn how to do this in a healthy way in every aspect of the art form which involves a lot of self-care. Yeah. So and we have to also understand the business of it, that it is a business. It's not personal. It's a business, right? right. And you have to understand how to run a business. I have, two, you know, three businesses, this program, Fondest, and then I have Living Mental Wellness, which is the mental wellness curriculum that I uh, co-created and founded for performing artists. Um, right. And if your listeners go to livingmentalwellness.com, uh, they can learn a little bit about that but we did research here and I, I did a TED talk on it quite a few years ago now but we um, developed a life skills program for performing artists and athletes because they have a lot of the same issues that, that we have um, to to help them learn how to foundationally manage their lives from brain science, mindfulness, uh, goal setting, time management, coping skills, communication skills, leadership skills, problem solving skills like you you have to actually know all that. You can't just whack your face eight times a week. Right. And I think that, Let's, you know. yeah, when I talk to the parents and things that are learning about your program, the parents are always so impressed with the, the mental wellness aspect of, of what you bring to the table. And um, several of my students in the past have taken that mental wellness uh, workshops and things that you offer too. So um, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is something that I hear repeatedly from students yeah. who are looking into your program that they're really impressed by. Well, we were able finally to get that curriculum online so that any anyone can have access to it. And what's been amazing is there, uh, like the most recently, the San Antonio ISD district, the high school, middle schools, and elementary schools, um, are now using the curriculum. Um, we trained and certified 450 high school, middle school, and uh, elementary school theater teachers mm -hmm. to incorporate it into their curriculum earlier, which is gonna gonna change things which is really really exciting um our university discovered that you know the musical theater program we're a university texas state is thirty nine thousand students right so it's like a big place we're the second largest theater department in the country we have close to a thousand majors almost 60 faculty and staff but the musical theater program within it is is teeny tiny but what's good is it means you have lots of performance opportunities so, you know, our program accepts 14 a year. We have like anywhere from 50 to 56 students in the program at any time. And what the university noticed was that our program had the highest academic achievers of any program at the university and the highest retention rates, meaning that we were retaining to graduate. We were graduating in four years, you know, the highest graduation rates and students, you know, graduating with honors and magna cum laude, summa cum laude with minors and other subjects like, and they were like, what's, what's happening over there? What are they doing? And, um, we had done a lot of research, uh, that this mental wellness curriculum was, was m making that difference. It was helping reduce stress, anxiety, depression, um, and increasing 
you can decrease those things through increasing your life skills, right? So now um, it's actually required of every incoming freshman in the theater department here. Um, the department now requires all students to take it, which is really cool. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, great. <laughs> that's so cool. I'm very proud of that. Um, that's awesome. So I think that, you know, that, that holistic approach, I, I think, um, sort of is very defining in the program. I think the fact that everything's under all, all under one umbrella that, you know, our, our musical theater faculty, um, that the, the program was designed in a, in a truly holistic way. But I also think the, the diversity here is very appealing to students. You know, we're a Hispanic serving institution, which means that over 56% of our student body at Texas state are uh, students of color. And, um, our university, like the mission of the university is based in social justice and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and you know, that's across the board, LBGTQIA, you know, our students of color, you know, um, and you really see that represented in the mission for the theater department and anti-racist theater, you know, producing anti-racist theater, um, really trying to, um, you know, be be on the forefront of those hard conversations and unpacking and looking at the pedagogy, because you know the art form Tim was was built on a racist foundation. Unfortunately, you know it was it's it's a very white centered art form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, which doesn't serve anybody. Absolutely. So you know what what we do here is really you know. Um, address that look at it uh you know how how do you create culturally responsive teaching methodology how do you create anti-racist pedagogy and you know implement it both in the classroom in the rehearsals how you cast how you uh, the narratives that you put forward in the plays and the musicals that you select you know sort of that's it's such a big part of what what we do here and what we want to do here and i think that we tend to attract artists that you know, that, that want to do that work, right? That, that want to um, be the leading voices in defining the art form and, and uh, moving, moving it forward. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think the other thing is also just sort of like the customized training is the other thing I'll, I'll sort of mention that I think sort of um, uh, sets us apart or is it, I won't say sets us apart. There's so many good training programs. Y'all can't go wrong, but that's sort of unique about us is that we really customize the degree plan for every individual in the program. We're small enough that we can do that. Um, but it's also what interests me, right? Is that I, I am many things, right? You are many things we are not, I'm not just an actor or singer or a producer or director or a, a, a playwright or a lozenge company maker, or, you know, like we are a teacher, you know, or a mentor or a wife or a friend, you know, like we are many things in our life. And college is about exploring that. College is about taking time to really dive into exploring who you are and what you have to say. So like, who are you? What do you stand for? Like, what do you, what are you passionate about? so that we have these individual tracks where like if you also want to choreograph you also are a composer you're also a songwriter you also want to try directing you also are a musical director you also are you know whatever whatever right, right. all those hyphenates they call it multi hyphenates now right right um you have opportunities here to explore any and all of that right so with with putting focuses it's it's kind of I would say the program's kind of entrepreneurial because we're really developing people who are also producing and also directing and also playwriting and all, you know, or creating the work because we do a lot of original or we, we produce and facilitate a lot of our students' original work. Right. So I tell my students often that, you know, when their, their parents or maybe they are concerned about having a backup plan, um, I usually say, well, your degree <laughs> yeah. is your backup plan. And in this case, yes. if you're able to customize your degree so much, your 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 learning skills that are still within the arts or still within the performing arts, but oh, sure. um, you know, 
if you're that passionate about something at 17 years old, that's never going to go away. So let you, you know the skills you learn within that degree be your backup plan. And it sounds like um, at Texas State, that's a really great opportunity for them to sort of build their own path within their degree and get the same degree that the students around them are getting, but they're able to make it fit to what they want to do and, and focus on all their skills. So that's so incredible. Yeah, and I would add to, you know, parents, you know, listening or watching that, it, you know, to sort of uh, piggyback on what you're saying is that a BFA degree is so valuable out in the world, not just in the arts, right? Mm -hmm. So very few of us do this forever. But how we view the world, the lens that we see the world through is a creative problem solving lens. You know, what does theater ultimately teach us, right? Collaboration, problem solving skills, creativity. So then whatever arena or, you know, day job or whatever it is else that you do in your life, right? Communication skills. I, I mean, who's better at selling you something than an actor? Exactly. We can sell anything. That's why so many of them work at Lululemon, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, can sell, we can sell anything, right? So... And we're good with people. We've got great people skills. We've got communication skills. We've got, you know, we've got problem solving, creative. So everything we do is through that lens. And all of this training facilitates that. You have no idea how many actors are running successful businesses. I mean, we we have graduates who, yeah, of course, you know, yeah, they're people on Broadway and they're students on, you know, graduates on national tours and graduates on TV series and films, like they're all working, okay? But I am just as proud of our graduates who in addition to doing that are also doing these other things or have evolved from those things and are now running an international um, art gallery, a multi-million dollar international art gallery, D running a design business that is um, creating, you know, designs for Gucci and Prada. And I mean, it's crazy what Tyler is doing. Um, starting a company in Chicago that is um, s s generating uh, self-sustainable products for the environment. I've got kids in grad school. I've got, you know, doing all kinds of extraordinary things with their lives. I've got an editor of a travel magazine, you know, these, and I, and I look at what, what these humans are doing out there. And I'm like, that's, everybody wants to be on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to win a Tony Award. Yes. And <laughs> right. Like, sure. Yes, do that. But you also have to be able to work in front of a camera, do voiceovers. Tim Heller, one of my graduates, is the most successful voiceover actor, has his own studio. I mean, he's amazing. Y'all should follow him on social media because he's hilarious. Um, you know, but it's, it's really exciting. This degree, my point was because I got sidetracked because I get, start to brag about my babies and I get excited about my bobcats. Um, my, my point being is that you are right, Tim, and you all should listen to Tim because he knows what he's talking about, <laughs> that it is a very, very valuable degree. Mm -hmm. And many people end up going to grad school for other things based on, right, this, uh, launching pad and many people are in show business forever, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so, Absolutely. oh, by the way, we have a whole new film and TV division. I mean, we've always had it, but it's like, <sighs> like gotten huge within the department we're getting a brand new building that's because we need all of the editing bays and right shooting studios and blah blah um so that's so really exciting you have a uh is that a bfa what is that degree that they're mm -hmm. offering? That's awesome. yeah so it's the bf the bfa in performance and production houses the large majority of the majors here and those majors can focus either in performance in film tv you know playwriting directing stage management oh, it's all the design tech areas um and oh gosh we must have over 20 classes in film and television production yeah. at least um and as part of our degree you are required to have a semester of on-camera acting film yes. to, so you can be Listen, yeah. if I hadn't worked in film and TV, I never would have had my health insurance half the time. So right. It's how you make money, commercials, voiceovers. So it's how actors make, make residuals. Hello. Yep. <laughs> um, so, 
you know, that, the, that creates, my point is that creates a lot of additional opportunities here for students to um, be, you know, doing film and TV work, creating acting reels. Uh, there's a film club, there's a web series writing class, a screenwriting class, and they're, they're producing product and, you know, creating music videos and all kinds of stuff. So if a student wants to come to Texas State and, and um, study theater or musical theater as a performer, is it uh, we have a BFA musical theater degree? Um, and what else uh-huh. there are performance degrees? Uh, oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so the there's a dance school, which is the second-ranked dance school in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's also the theater department. And so there's a BFA in musical theater, a BFA in acting, and a BFA in what they call performance and production, which houses, like I said, like probably f- at least 400 of our majors are within that, uh, fall under that BFA umbrella. And then there's also MFAs in directing um, and all the design tech areas, you know, lighting, sound, uh, lighting costumes, sets. Are there BA tracks or just the BFAs? Just the BFAs, I think they used to have a BA, but I think they I thought I think so. they phased it out. I didn't. I haven't had any students. I think look yeah, at they it, did so. when I got here, but I think yeah, I think they I they, they phased it out. And how how long um, have you been there? When did you start yeah. there? Fall of two thousand nine. Mm, you did a lot in a relatively short amount of time because Texas State is one of the programs that comes up on everybody's list when they first start looking. So, yay! Well done, yeah. Yes, put us on our put it. Thank you. Put it on your list, please. Come come check us out. Um, you mentioned briefly that there are a lot of performance opportunities for students at the school. Can you talk about that a little mm-hmm. bit more? Yeah. I mean, it, with a theater department this size, you know, especially with all those design tech kids, right? Everything is designed and built here. Please go to our YouTube channel. Go to the Texas State Musical Theater YouTube channel. Follow us on social media. Uh, because you will you will get to see a lot of the work, right? So um, in our department, we have two musicals a year and at least six plays, sometimes more. We have um, the Black and Latino Playwrights Conference, which is a new play development with um, Black and Latinx uh, professional playwrights and directors that come down here to develop new plays with the students. We have the new work uh, series. Um, we within the musical theater program, we are um, either commissioning and or producing new musical workshops and readings with Broadway creative teams that are coming down and creating the work with the students. So um, we've actually done two world premieres here. Um, Andrew Lippa's Little Princess was that that world premiere was done here before it uh, was licensed internationally. And uh, World According to Snoopy we developed here and and, um, not only did a co-production with the major regional theater, but also with um, Theater Aspen. And, you know, we've had lots of just incredible playwrights and composers coming down here and, and doing new work. Um, so those are those are also performance opportunities, uh, the film and television uh, department, you know, the film club. There's a lot of uh, opportunities on camera. And because of the MFA directing program, there's lots of MFA uh, project scenes, you know, what have you. So it's, it's also, we, I don't know how many student run production companies we have within the department now, but they have their own, uh, space to produce in. It's totally student run. I think we have five or six, um, student run production companies that are also creating, uh, sorry, producing, you know, plays and, all kinds of things in, in that uh, student-run space. That's wonderful. Do your uh, BFA kids have the opportunity to minor in something, or is the program too packed? Oh, yeah. No, I, I would actually say that, you know, I should actually find out the exact percentage. But off the top of my head, I'm going to say probably at least 80% of the students wow, that minor many. in something else. That's that's mm-hmm. wonderful. That's That's mm-hmm. a lot. Most of them are in the Honors College and... That's really you know uh, doing thesis and yeah research all kinds of stuff. Great, it's interesting. Like and I, you know I can hear your your kids watching being like, but what do they minor in? So I've got I'm trying to think of off the top of my head, women's studies, um, physics, math, Spanish, poli sci. We've got an amazing business school here, so we've got quite a few like business 
minors, communication Which is minors. Very smart. Very smart to do a business minor or an arts management minor or something like that. That's so smart. Yeah, to do. that's just so smart. And we've got amazing program yeah. here. Um, yeah. That's so, great. oh, um, I mean, gosh, uh, uh, Lou Chavez, who's from Mexico City, is one of my uh, juniors. She's actually doing a double major in social work and musical theater. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so tell us a little bit about, um, you know, San Marcos, Texas. If a student wants to leave oh, campus, um, what is mm -hmm. there to see and do in that area? Because um, that's not a, a very well-known Texas city. So um, talk a little I'd bit about that. I'd, ne I, I'd never heard of it. Oh, no. I've never so, been there. So. <laughs> just, I, I, was, I was born and raised in New York City. Right. And so I was like, oh, are those deer? Are those <laughs> turtles like what is that what is all this wildlife that's here it's so beautiful um you guys it really is it's incredible so we're 30 miles south of austin um we're literally between san antonio and austin like in the smack in the center um and if you're hearing that clickety clack i don't know if you can hear that it's your corgis it's, it's tap dancing it's they're tap dancing <laughs> under the desk sorry um so it's so beautiful here. We're in the hill country. So I had only ever been to Dallas or Houston when I was doing national tours, neither of which I, I particularly liked very much. Um, so I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about, about Texas in general. Um, but it's so beautiful here. This whole corridor from Austin to San Antonio, there's so much to do. There's so much live music and artwork. And Austin is the most incredible city with film festivals and music festivals and um it's it, it's really and also if you're a foodie this is a place to be san marcos texas is the place to be if you're a foodie well austin, austin. And san okay <laughs> like it but also san marcos like it's unbelievable the students are always like if you like to eat <laughs> <laughs> come here it's incredible the the just the diversity and cuisine and the wow. amazing uh, well, I have, here. I, have <laughs> I, I have to admit, Texas State is one of the schools that I've actually never been to, and I want to change that this year. Um, so yeah, you need to come see us. Yeah, so well, really we're gonna get out from the we're going to try to do some on campus workshops and things with my students this year. So awesome. we'll chat soon, and maybe I'll bring some some kiddos and we'll come check it out. Um, oh, there's there's the tour. Hi. <laughs> For those of you who are, some, some people are going to watch this without the video, so they're going to think we're totally weird. Oh. But. <laughs> they're like, we're, uh, Lily, Dale, Lily Dale just made an appearance. So if you're just listening and not watching. If, if you're listening to this on, you on it. Apple Podcasts, you're going to miss the, look, the videos. I'm licking but. my nose. <laughs> um, so this, this next section that we, we go into is what all of the students always want to know. Because they always, you know, students think that there's some some magic formula to acing your auditions <gasps> at school. So let's talk about the audition process. Okay. Um, and you can tell me a little bit. Um, yeah, let's just start with with some numbers. Um, how many applicants um, do you actually see each year? And, and break that down to pre-screens versus live and all of that. You've already told us that the class that you aim for size-wise is 14. So how many we applicants? We aim for 14. Sometimes it's 12, sometimes it's 16, but the goal is 14. So how many applicants I, I, I don't like big classes. Okay, so I, I want to preface this with, with the following. Um, parents, uh -huh. please try not to freak out about numbers, yeah? Because it's not indicative of competition. And here's what I mean by that. So a school can have 200 applicants or 2,000 applicants, it doesn't really matter how many people apply because that's not actually the talent pool that your kids are competing within. Here's what I mean by that. So we have about 800 applicants a year, right? It, sometimes it's, you know, more, sometimes it's a little less, like but somewhere between 750 and 900 is like kind of ish, right? And that sounds like a lot. Except that <laughs> not all of those people are, are competitive and talented, right? And not all of those people are men and not all of those people are women. And not all of them 
are right for our program and we're not right for them, right? They're throwing their net really, really wide. The reason there's so many applicants to these programs is because you all are applying to 12 to 20 schools, not because we're so awesome, although we are so awesome. But do you see my point? Mm -hmm. If y'all are, are, oh, I can't believe I just said y'all. You're saying okay. y'all a lot. I noticed that too. I, I was you know what? call you on I, that. But... I think, you know what? I just think I'm tired. As a fellow And I've been friend, around, you know. I get it. Mm. I, I picked it up living in Florida. I think my Florida days are numbered. I'm saying y'all too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I don't know what is happening today. Um, okay, so the numbers. It, it, I think it's important to put the numbers in context because they can sound overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And especially to parents who are like, are you kidding me? Why would you, you know? Um, and you also hear things like, well, you, you know, they, that means they're only accepting 2% of their applicants. Well, that's kind of true of most schools, regardless of, of whether, you know, how many applicants they have. That's about the average, which is why you guys are throwing your nuts so wide. But we are not right for every student that applies. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going for the students that we really feel we can serve, that we really, you know, and, and it's a it's like dating. It's a process. You and us are all trying to figure out whether it's a good fit. Right. right. And whether you're going to trust us with your career and your life and your well-being for the next four years. So that being said, about 800 applicants. OK. And I think this year it was like 850 or something. Right. In terms of number of, of artists that we then actually see in person for callbacks, about 200. Mm -hmm. There's no like exact number. Right. So maybe it's 160. Maybe it's 230. Right. It depends. Um, on how many people we get excited about. And we feel like, oh, that, that person may be really right for us. Out of the, let, let's, let's call it 200 because it's a nice number and it's pretty close, right? So out of those 200, there are a lot of people that we say no to that are freaking off the charts, unbelievable, incredibly good. I'm an idiot. It would be great to have them in my, pro right? Like, uh, it it would be an honor to work with these students. They're just not right for us for one reason or another. Sometimes we're not, that's not what we need this year. So, you know, who knows? Like there's a million things that go into why y'all get into, huh. why you get into the programs that you get into. Don't you make fun of me tonight. <laughs> um, right? There's a lot of components to that. It's not just mm -hmm. talent many many things out of those 200 you know we narrow that down through deliberations to about 40 students that we ultimately make about 18 to 23 24 offers to get that class of 12 to 16 right, right? I, I don't think i've ever made more than 23 offers so, you know, so it just depends. And we tend to also do it gradually. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like we kind of spread it out. It's kind of roll, you know, because we're, it's not just about talent. You guys, we're trying to put together a really crunchy, unique, interesting group of humans in a room together to see what kind of art they make. Right. Like, yeah. so it's also personalities. It's, um, it, there's so many different things that you're thinking about. And so we tend to also sort of take our time. I know it drives everybody crazy, but because everyone says, talks to each calls? other and they'll say, Oh, well, I hear Caitlin's making phone calls today. And then those parent social media groups explode and my phone starts ringing a million times because. And they're like, she's, she's done. She's, she's made off. No, I'm and... actually, I'm, I'm still making offers. Uh, like I'm still right I now. Was, like it is still yeah. in process. I was talking about this. not done with not remotely. done. Right. I was talking about this with Kevin at Shenandoah just recently when recording one of these and I think that the, the students and the parents think that there's a set of rules that is followed like to the letter during this process. And it's not really that there's, there's no real no. step by step. It's not a linear process either because you don't know what's going to happen once you make the offers, the, the first set of offers. Um, and one of the big questions that I always get to is about the wait list because they think, um, 
students tend to think that you know you're assigned a number on a wait list and if number two drops out then number three must be in and that's not the case at all so could you talk a little bit no. about your yes. this process the wait list process and all yes, of that be because the wait list who who uh, I'll, I won't speak for all schools, but who we go to next, but I know it's true for many of them because they're my friends and we talk all the time in our group chat. <laughs> That's the programs we all have a great group chat. Um, who we go to depends on who says no. Mm -hmm. And, and may, maybe multiple people who pass, you don't necessarily go to the, the next girl, right? Mm -hmm. Like if a girl passes, you don't necessarily go to a girl. We may go to a guy. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just because it's a somebody who maybe primarily is a dancer, thinks of themselves as a dancer, doesn't mean we're necessarily going to go to another dancer. Right. Right? Like, there, there's no rhyme or reason to that wait list. There's no, it's really, really hard to give, uh, and I, I always try to, I always make the effort to say like, look, I'm trying to give you as much information as I can about your status, like where you stand right now. But usually like the most specific that we're able to get is look, you're one of a, a very few people in this remaining talent pool, mm -hmm. because out of those maybe 40 people that you, you know, ultimately are, 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 are selecting from some of them withdraw says some of them go to other program, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so you end up with sort of this core of 2025 20, artists that you're kind of navigating this very, very fluid process. And the thing that breaks my heart is I think if students assume that because they're on the wait list, it means they're, we don't think they're as good or we don't want them as much. Right. Because the truth is if I could take 20, all 25 of those kids, I would. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, it's about, it's about the whole program. And so literally how we pick that class, who's graduating. Oh yeah. What do we need? You're you're putting together a company of artists, and you have to. That's a process. There's no way. Mm -hmm. There's no formula, and frankly, we make it up half the time as we go along. It it changes. Yes. And you know, Kevin forever texting me going, "What are you guys doing this year? Are you doing a waitlist year this year?" And Joe Deere's like, "I don't. You know, I don't know. Are you doing a wait? We're, yeah, we're doing a wait. You know, like everybody like yeah." especially this and year especially with the whole COVID yep. thing making up the rules as we go talking, along we're making it up as we go along and in our group chat everybody's like who's doing a wait list is anybody doing no yeah some some of us are some of us aren't some of us are like it's kind of a wait list it's not really a wait list I don't know what it is you are you're really spilling the tea on what goes on behind the scenes today Caitlin. Well, because, look because I I think that it's there's no reason for it not to be transparent Thank the you. problem is there is no reason for it not to be transparent. The problem is people don't communicate well and people don't listen. And here's what I mean by that. A lot of people go on these college websites or they're talking on social media and they make assumptions and parents make assumptions. And then they share those assumptions like they're facts. Right. And it's just not coolio. Like no, it's, it's, it's not fair. It's not fair to these programs. And it's not fair to the students applying to the programs who then are like, oh, well, I'm not going to apply to that school because I heard they only take dancers mm -hmm. or I heard that they only like people who are blah, blah, blah right? So, mm -hmm. or they're all, or Caitlin's only looking for this this year. Oh, really? Who did I say that? Right. Because guess what? I, I will say exactly what I'm So ask me, yeah. don't, don't read a, a thread on a nonsense college confidential just ask me i'll tell you <laughs> right Caitlin's like, dropping names sorry <laughs> sorry college confidential but i'm just right well i'm just I, well i'm sure there are other ones you know it's the, I'm just the saying, facebook like, groups and stuff too that can get the facebook groups and they get i hear about them they you can, know and you go on that stuff they can but. be very positive and a great thing for for parents to be supportive of each other and resources things. but mm -hmm. i've said this to every group of kids I've had for since I've started coaching kids 17 years ago, the only way to stay sane during this process is to keep your cards close to your chest. Don't don't tell anyone even who you're auditioning for because you know what if you put out on Facebook, hey everyone, I'm going to Texas State today to do my auditions. I or I, I passed my pre screen. I'm going for my live audition at Texas State. All you're doing is setting yourself up for then later having to say. 
I didn't get into Texas State, guys. You know, that you're That's setting right. yourself up for that. It's nobody's business. There's no reason why you have to no. announce this every step of the way. And and you know, I have I have students that are friends with each other that came to me, friends before they came to me. Um, and you know, they want to share this information with each other, but if the one student is getting into all the dream schools and the other student isn't doing so well, you know, that, that other student wants to be supportive of their friend, but it's still killing them on the inside to hear what this other student is, is able to achieve. Listen to Tim. And just, just listen to Tim. Make this a very private, uh, process and it's going to save you so much strife. Um, Something else that, that that I wanted to touch on too is um, you. Um, we, we were talking about how there's no real rules to this process, and something that tends to muddy up the gears a little bit, especially at this time of year, is when there's offers on the table, and then the student sits on that offer, waiting for those schools that are getting. I, I have to tell you this, Caitlin. I know that there's a couple of my students that you're waiting on hearing from. But they're waiting to hear financial aid offers from schools that aren't releasing yeah. until April 1st. So I know, that slows everything the, down so much. Finan- it slows everything down. But you're up against a wall. I, keep, I mean, financial aid is yeah, really I keep, important. Fi- financial aid muddies it, mucks it up, slows it down, and drives us all crazy. And I want you all to understand something. We are also waiting. Mm-hmm. You are not the only people that are waiting. I'm terrified I'm not going to make my class, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, right? Everybody, you know, we're all like, oh, God, mm-hmm. what's going to happen? You know, because we're we're all waiting. And that is stressful for all of us. It's why I'm, I, you know, I try to go and communicate with the students that are on our wait list or that haven't heard from us yet and just say, listen, I'm in a holding pattern. Here's why. Mm-hmm. We've made our first round of offers. You're still in the conversation. You're really in the conversation. We really want you here. I'm hoping something opens up. Kids are waiting on their financial packages. Mm -hmm. And nothing's going to shift until, especially this year, you guys. Oh, my gosh. Nothing's going to shift until these students get all their financial packages and know, you know, they might have my heart choices here, but my money choices, you know, like. And some of the schools aren't even releasing their answer or their 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 results until April 1st and then financial aid can come after that. So this year it just seems wait, like some schools aren't announcing their like offers until April 1st. No, yeah. Yeah. Really? I've got, I'm not going to name late, names, but it? there's three of them, three of them that are always notoriously late. Um, <sighs> but they've actually like announced April 1st is our date this year. So, um, that's well, then a every uh, the, a lot of stuff will shift, then. and it and it happens so quickly. Um, it happens so fast, you guys. It's gonna shift real fast yeah. when the when that happens. All of a sudden, people start accepting right. offers, and all of a sudden, I'll be like, "Yep." And because people are <laughs> sitting, to Texas, you know, you're not just sitting on an offer for admissions. You're you're sitting on all of that scholarship dollars that was offered to you too, which can go to other students. So that's why. I mean, I'm reminding my kids every day, oh, as soon as us. you know, as soon as you know a school's a no, you yeah. have to let them know. Because I know in many cases, you're sitting on an offer that I personally have four other kids on a wait list for. So you will help your fellow students yeah. in our group if you do this. So. That's right. It's um, the best way you can all help help each other. Yeah. yeah. Um, hey, uh, Tim, yeah. can I can I mention something yeah. that you talked about that uh, I just want to circle back really fast mm-hmm. when Tim was talking to you about keeping it close to the vest. Please make that a career lifelong habit. Don't use social media as a way to, to, to fill those insecurities of needing to prove to people that you are successful or worthy or whatever. You know, if this is a calling, if you're called to do this, you're called to do this. You know what I mean? It, it, mm-hmm. it, being an actor, right? mm-hmm. if you could choose something else, you would, right? So it's a calling. So trust that and trust that you're meant to be here and meant to do this. Do not go on social media and share when you have callbacks, when you book jobs until after the first day of rehearsal or until after your contract and the producers say it's okay to publicize it. Right. You don't have to tell everybody your business. Exactly. Like who cares? And tell your parents the same thing. Tell your I know your parents are super proud of you, but I I see on it's social media helpful. sometimes of you know, I get a lot of parents that follow me on social media that aren't my clients. They, you know, they're just here for the, the tips and tricks sure. and things that I share. But 
I see some of them posting, my daughter was accepted to the following five BFA programs and um, they're big name programs. And I said, you don't want to put that information out there. Uh, really don't. You don't keep it all. Well, I could go on and on and on about this, but. Par- parents post after they get the jobs and the job yes. is actually in process, yes. right? You can be just as proud of a, them. a lot of pretty, well, you can also lose them those jobs professionally, right? Because contractually they're not allowed to. Mm-hmm announce yeah. that stuff so there are a lot of jobs you, you know they make you sign a contract that says you can't even say your call back or auditioning right. for it right let alone that you got it right. <laughs> so all right what's next wrapping up here today um let's okay. let's close out with just um you know what qualities are you looking for when you're watching these 800 pre-screens and um, oh. 200 to 300 in-person auditions what makes a student stick out to you that makes a light bulb go off and say, hey, this, this kid would be great at Texas State? Good question. Um, integrity. Uh, presence. Being present in the moment, you know, mm-hmm. with us. Um, sense of humor. <laughs> Four years is a long time. Um, you know, uh, you, I mean, you know, when you, when you call people back, you already know you want them, right? You already know you want to work with them or you wouldn't have called them back. So then it starts to become about other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm looking for people who are joyful in the work, who aren't afraid to fail, who recognize, well, let me rephrase that. We're all afraid to fail, but want to do it anyway that understand that failing is actually about striving for excellence, that perfection doesn't serve you, that um, that through failing forward, we get better at what we do. And it's kind of like you got to be willing to suck at something to to become an expert in your craft. You have to be willing to take those risks and, and, and really dive in. I'm looking for people who, um, you know, want to work on that, want to explore that. Um, I'm, work, uh, I'm looking for artists, you know, for, you know, yes, talent, but not just talent. You know, uh, again, I, a lot of people can sing. That doesn't really impress me that much. <laughs> talent opens right? the door. Like, that's not a skill. Yeah. I'm like, can you tell a story? Because we're storytellers, whether it's through movement. Like, I, I don't care whether people can dance or not. I care about whether they can have expression through movement, whether they can tell a story through movement whether they can do a double or a triple or I, I, I still can't do any of that stuff. And you've done pretty well never, for yourself without ever having to do that. I, I, I think I mean, I did. Okay. And I never could do that. <laughs> in fact, I tried to do it a couple of years ago um, in front of my students just for fun. And I almost, and, and I fell over <laughs> and one of my students caught me. <laughs> I think it was Preston. It was Preston Perez was like, Oh, I got you. K hop. It's okay. <laughs> I was like, you know, I just thought, you know, in my fifties, I should give it one last shot and see if I can do a pirouette. Yeah. You know? What what great um, what great closing comments? You, you, talent gets you in the door, but it's it's everything else the the total package that's really going to get. Well, it's your back. it's your it's your humanity, right? It's your will. Yeah. It's your you know what do you look for? Someone who's willing to be seen. Mm-hmm. So real qu- one more thing, real quick. Do you think that your auditions sure. this coming year will be a hundred percent? In person? Will they be virtual? What are you talking about doing? Wow, that is such a good question. I'm so glad. You, I love you, Tim. I'm so glad you asked that. Here's my experience. We had more, I don't know, I think we had about 100, 150 more applicants. I don't know. There was, we had a lot more applicants this year, right? And and in my group chat with my friends who were running out of the programs, everybody has seen huge increases in numbers this year which makes no sense, right? Theater's not happening. And we're in the middle of it, right? So why are all the programs seeing this massive jump in applicants? It's called accessibility. Yep. It's called equity. It's, right, it became more affordable and accessible for everyone to audition for these programs because it didn't cost a gazillion dollars Mm -hmm. to audition for a dozen programs because everybody was doing it online. So here's my answer. I don't ever want to go back to a world 
where somebody who wants to do this can't do it because of money. Amen. I don't, I don't want to go back to that world. Do I want to see people in person? Of course I do. I love it. Can I make a decision equitably if I see someone virtually audition or in person? Absolutely I can. And I know that now because I, I just spent an entire year recruiting and teaching online. Hmm. So I know now what, what's possible, right? And I know that I can see you this way or see you in person and that you both have an equal opportunity, you know, that, that, that we can, I can get the information I need about you as a human and an artist and know if we're the right fit for you, right? So the answer is both because we're serving a demographic that largely can't afford, you know, like a, couple, a, lot, a lot of kids who have financial issues where state school, mm -hmm. you know, the good thing about Texas state parents is all of my out of state students and over 90% of my program are out of state or international students, right? We have maybe like 10 Texas kids. I wish we had more Texas kids. If you're from Texas, please think about staying home and apply here. Um, but my, my point being is that all my out-of-state students get in-state tuition. We're allowed to give you a thousand dollars a year scholarship that's guaranteed for four years that qualifies you for in-state tuition, which saves you about thirteen thousand dollars in tuition costs. And we're also very, very reasonable. Our tuition's under thirteen thousand a year. A year. So with all the bells and whistles, room board, all that, so if you budget twenty-five to twenty-six thousand a year you'd be fine, right? In state or out of state, same, same dealio. That's and they give a lot of money for academic scholarships. That's wonderful. That's so great. We've got a lot of kids here who get, you know, like 12 grand a year for their academics. Wow. And the tuition's 13. So I'm like, okay. Can't beat that. Well, Miss Caitlin Hopkins, it's been so nice to, I guess, reconnect with you. It's been months since I've seen you last, and that's largely my fault, but <laughs> um, it's it's really great to see you again. And Hardly. like I said, um, I want to reach out to you again soon and hopefully bring some kids to campus this year for some workshops and things. And, I would love that. And um, love that. I, I know you're going to be hearing from a couple of my kids real soon. So thanks again for joining us today. <gasps> <laughs> all right. Good to see you all. Be well. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye. For more information on the exciting training, workshops, and masterclasses offered by The College Audition, please visit us online at www.thecollegeaudition.com or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok.